Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. The Son is the eternal Son of the Father. This is one of those phrases that the ancient church fathers used. They used this phrase to summarize everything that the Bible had to say about that particular subject. The Son is the eternal Son of the Father. Bible passage after Bible passage testifies to the divinity of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. All things were made by Him. There is not one thing that has been made that was not made by Him. And that Word that was God became flesh, made His dwelling among us. We have beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten Son of the Father. Romans chapter 9 says, that from the Jews is traced the human ancestry of the Christ, who is God over all, forever praised. Colossians 2 testifies that in Christ, all the fullness of deity dwells by. The ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ testifies to His divinity also. He commands the wind and the sea, and they obey Him. He changes water into wine, and the disciples behold His glory and put their faith in Him. And if Jesus is God, then He is eternal. He always was. He is and He always will be. He is the eternal God, and at the same time that He is the eternal God, the Scriptures testify that He is the Son of the Father. John chapter 1 put the divinity of our Lord and the fact that He is the only begotten Son together in one passage. Peter confesses, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. When Peter makes that confession, the living God turns to him and says, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. There are countless passages throughout the New Testament that testify that Jesus is the Son of God. And if He is God and is eternal, and if He is the Son of God, then you have to say He is the eternal Son of the Father. He always was the Son of the Father. He is the Son of the Father. He always will be the Son of the Father. So if Jesus is the Son of the Father, and always was, and always will be, why does the Father bother to open up the heavens at the Son's baptism and say, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased? Seems to me that the voice from heaven is saying something obvious. If He always was the Son of the Father, He is the Son of the Father, and always will be the Son of the Father, why should the Father bother to open up the heavens and say it? If Peter confesses, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, and the Christ says, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven, that means that the Son already knows that He's the Son of the Father. So why do the heavens have to open up in order to say that? It's like saying that the grass is green and the sky is blue. Well, obviously the heavens do open up. God doesn't just open up the heavens at any old time. If He's opening up the heavens, it must be really important. So this God, Jesus from Nazareth, is baptized by John the Baptist in the Jordan River. And that's when the heavens open. And the voice from heaven says, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. The Father does this for two reasons. One, so that you know who 
the eternal Son of the Father is, it's Jesus from Nazareth. And secondly, so that the Father may publicly proclaim that truth to everyone. Some of the Gospels record that God opened up the heavens at the baptism of our Lord and said, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. Those Gospels are emphasizing the fact that the Father spoke these words to the Son. The Son already knows that they're true, but now the Father is speaking them publicly. You are my beloved Son. Other Gospels record that the voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased, to emphasize the fact that the Father didn't just speak those words to the Son, but He also spoke them to you. And by speaking those words publicly and audibly for all to hear, He gave to His Son and to you the great confession. When you confess your faith, you are saying the same thing that God says. God says of Jesus of Nazareth, this is my beloved Son. So when you say the same thing about Jesus of Nazareth, you are making confession. You are confessing the same thing that God says. So God opens up the heavens and says, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased to give you the great confession. Jesus then guarded that confession for the rest of His life. By giving that confession to you, God wants you to guard that confession for the rest of your life also. In order to see clearly how Jesus guarded the confession that He was the eternal Son of the Father, we have to understand what it means when the Father opens up the heavens and says, This is my beloved Son. God is declaring His relationship with Jesus of Nazareth, but He's also declaring something else. When the Father opens the heavens and says, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased, He is quoting Psalm number 2. Psalm number 2 is a royal psalm. If you read Psalm number 2, you get the distinct impression that the priests and the Levites in the temple sang that psalm every time a new king of Judah ascended the throne. The psalm talks about how the, the nations rage against the Lord God and against His anointed. His anointed would be the king of Judah. And so the nations rage against God, and they rage against the king of Judah, but the one who is enthroned in heaven laughs. I have installed my king on Zion, my holy hill. It's that line right there that guarantees that Psalm number 2 was sung when a new king of Judah ascended the throne. God installed his king on Zion, his holy hill. Then further on in the psalm, God addresses the king directly and says, Today you are my son, I have begotten you. In fact, God had promised the descendants of David that if they kept his rules and his statutes, he would regard them as sons. Now here comes the eternal son of the father in human flesh. John the Baptist baptizes him in the Jordan River. The Father opens the heavens and says, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. He is not only asserting that all the kings of Judah who came before Jesus were only reflections of him and, Jesus, and God regarded them as sons, but this is the true Son of the Father. He is also saying that this is the true King of Israel. Jesus guarded that confession. Jesus stewarded that confession. Throughout the entirety of his ministry, he acts like he's the king of Israel. When the Roman centurion confesses his faith, Jesus says, Never have I seen such faith even in Israel. I tell you, Many will come from the north and the south, from the east and the west, to recline at table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But 
the sons of the kingdom will be cast out. And who is Jesus to make determinations on who is in the kingdom and who is out of the kingdom? He is the king. He is the righteous king who keeps all of God's statutes and laws to whom God promises that he will make Israel into an everlasting kingdom. Jesus calls it the kingdom of heaven. He stewarded that confession. He guarded that confession. He received anyone who attributed to him the title of the son of David. And when he got on that donkey and rode into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, all of his public supporters turned out and said, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father, David. They confessed along with him that he was the king of Israel. And so it is little wonder that after Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the donkey, the temple administration has this extended debate with him. Who gave you the authority to do all these things? What's your position on taxes, King Jesus? If you're really a king, you're going to have to take a position on taxes. Shall we pay them to Caesar or not? And point by point, blow by blow, Jesus guarded the good confession that he himself was the king of Israel. And even in the days before his death, he continued to demand and command and declare who was in his kingdom and who was out. And he threw out the scribes and the chief priests, told them that they were the wicked tenants. He welcomed the tax collectors, the prostitutes, and the Gentiles into the kingdom of heaven because they produced the kingdom's fruits. And then finally, the Lord Jesus stood in front of Pontius Pilate. <laughs> Pontius Pilate. <laughs> Man. You know, I have a soft spot in my heart for Pontius Pilate. Not that I think that he's saved, but I sympathize with the man. All he wants is a straight answer from Jesus of Nazareth. That's it. Are you a king? If you claim to be a king, I'll crucify you. If you don't claim to be a king, I'll let you go. And I don't care what the chief priests and, priests and scribes say. That's all he wanted was a straight answer from Jesus. How tempting it would have been to our Lord to have given him a straight answer. And there are two temptations that faced our Lord in that moment. One, to obtain glory. And two, to save his life. How easy it would have been to have given Pontius Pilate a straight answer and said, I am a king. Then Pontius Pilate would have crucified him and Jesus would have gained glory for himself. All of his public supporters would have rallied around him and rallied around his cross as he died that victorious martyr's death as the king of Israel, shaking his fist at Caesar. But Jesus knows that if he says that, Pontius Pilate will misunderstand what he means by a king. Jesus has already asserted that Caesar doesn't need to worry about Jesus. He can have his taxes. At least Caesar doesn't need to worry about Jesus in the way that Caesar thinks that he needs to worry about Jesus. My kingdom is not of this world, and I want Pontius Pilate to understand that, so that's what I'm going to tell him. My kingdom is not from this place. If it were, my followers would have fought to prevent my arrest by the Jews, but as it is, my kingdom is not from here. And Pontius Pilate says, so you're a king. And Jesus says, well, you have said so. I have come to testify to the truth. Anyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. At that point, if I were Pontius Pilate, I think I would have taken a stick and hit him. He doesn't give me a straight answer. 
The reason that Jesus does not give Pontius Pilate a straight answer is because Jesus is stewarding, he's guarding the good confession. Yes, I am a king, but not one like what you think. The other temptation that Jesus faces is to save his life. He could easily do that. All he has to do is say to Pontius Pilate something like this. Look, Pilate, I've told Caesar that he can have his taxes. If I am a king, my kingdom isn't from this world anyway, and so you have nothing to worry about. And Pontius Pilate would have let him go, and Jesus would have saved his life. But if Jesus says that, he is also lying to Pontius Pilate. The kingdom of Jesus is not pretend. The kingdom of Jesus is not make-believe. Just because the kingdom of Jesus doesn't exact taxes and have an army doesn't mean it's not real. He is a king. So he cannot stand in front of Pontius Pilate and deny his kingship. And so he says, my kingdom is not of this place. I testify to the truth. Anyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Jesus stewarded the good confession. He avoided the temptation on the one hand to obtain glory for himself. And he avoided the temptation on the other hand to save his own life. And so when Jesus did die, when Pontius Pilate sentenced him to be crucified, none of his supporters were there. The only people that were there were his mom, the disciple whom he loved, and Mary Magdalene. That's it. Everyone else abandoned him. There were no supporters rallying around his cross. Only his enemies spitting at him and mocking him. He obtained no glory by this death. The only reason you and I remember it as glorious is because of his resurrection. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. That is the confession that Jesus stewarded. It is also the confession that God has given to you. He has said to you, this is my beloved son. With him I am well pleased. You steward that confession every time you recite the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord. And when you steward that, con that confession, just like Jesus, you will be tempted in one of two ways. You will be tempted either to use it to obtain glory for yourself, or you will be tempted to relinquish it altogether to live an easier life. We face these temptations all the time. The temptation to use the confession of our faith as a means for obtaining glory for ourselves is before us all the time. Especially in this time of hardship and pestilence, it seems like the temptation to obtain glory for ourselves is much more intense. Look at us! Look how we're confessing our faith! But if the glory is going to be for us, then the glory will not be for Him. That's why it's a temptation. While the temptation for some of us on the one hand will be to use the occasion to obtain glory for ourselves, the temptation on the other hand for others is to relinquish the confession altogether. And this temptation is with us whether we're in a time of trial or not. There's always that temptation to laziness. To simply relinquish the confession. To simply quit reciting it all the time. To say in this time of pestilence, see there, the word of the sacraments aren't all that necessary. They're suspending church for a while. If they're not necessary then, surely they're not necessary at other times too. And that's the temptation that we face, and it is the exact same temptation that our Lord faced when he stood in front of Pontius Pilate. What your Lord has done for you is he has paved a way in between these two options. He has paved a way so that you may hang on and steward that confession without glory for yourself on the one hand and without relinquishing it on the other. He 
has steered that path for you clear to His cross, and it is that cross under which we live. As long as we live under that cross, there will be no glory for ourselves. And as long as we live under that cross, we will not give it up. Jesus stewarded the good confession until he was dead. And he rose from the dead. And you also, when you steward the good confession that Jesus is the eternal Son of the Father, and you steward it to your death, you will rise from the dead too. And you will live as long as he does. In the name of Jesus. Amen. The litany 